Hello again, and welcome to our first lecture on Romanticism. So right off the bat, things to be aware of with the term Romanticism. Although some of the stories will have uh, romantic aspects in terms of being about relationships, in terms of love and sexual romance, the term Romanticism is really not about that aspect alone. The romantic style exists in writing, it exists in music as much as it exists in visual art. So there are romantic poets, romantic novelists, and the best example I can give you of a romantic novel, believe it or not, is Mary Shelley's Frankenstein. Romantic style, whether it's in music, in the written word, in literature, or in painting or sculpture, is generally about storytelling of people in really extreme circumstances, people pushed to the edge. Um, generally, the stories are a bit darker. They don't always end well. They do still tell, to some extent, moral stories the way that the stories of the neoclassical artists did, but they tend to show people pushed to utmost despair and extreme. Um, the Settings in romantic paintings usually are outside of American or European culture. Uh, we'll see people in what would have been called exotic locations and exotic cultures. Uh, also, if you look at the neoclassical style, you see that a lot of the figures and compositions are very stiff. The figures are close to the front of the picture plane. They almost feel like actors on a stage. With the romantics, you're going to see much more use of curvaceous form, um, much more attention to color. So the neoclassical classical artists really you could classify as being people again more allied with Poussin, Poussinists, and the romantics tend to be obsessed more with color. They would qualify much more as being Rubenists. So the romantics we'll look at first in France and in Spain, Jericho, Delacroix, and Goya are the names to look out for. I wanted to give you a couple other examples though, just to get us going. This is a great example of an artist who is really um, known as sort of a transitional figure because both of these styles, neoclassical and romantic, existed at the same time. So Girardet becomes a painter who really starts off uh, as a student of Jacques-Louis David, directly studying under the master of neoclassical style. And this is one of his early pieces, which has obvious reference to classical sculpture, but the pose, the swoon, the softness feels a little bit more romantic. So really, Giraudet's paintings can become kind of half and half between neoclassical and romantic. Even this piece, a tragic love story, feels almost like like Romeo and Juliet, but the way that it's painted, the musculature of the figure at the left in particular, feels a bit closer to the neoclassical style. Um, also, this piece is based on a popular novel of the day. The novel Atala tells the story of star-crossed lovers, a woman who has made a vow to remain chaste, to remain a virgin. She ends up falling desperately in love with, is sexually tempted by uh, this Native American hero on the left, and in order to preserve her soul, she ends up killing herself rather than give in ultimately to the lust that they both feel. So it definitely is a little bit closer to a neoclassical kind of of moral storytelling in a way, but it's so dark and extreme, it feels like it is also equally well uh, placed in the romantic style. To really get to the heart of romanticism, though, you have to look at the poses and the drama that's being portrayed. And so that brings us to the artist Jericho. Jericho is a painter who definitely is giving us curvature, drama, color, a little bit softer edges to things as opposed to the neoclassical style. The drama that's being portrayed here comes straight out of the real world. The Raft of the Medusa by Jericho depicts an actual event in real history. The French had colonies in Africa at the time, and the raft here is what's left of a ship that had been carrying colonists to 
Africa. It was managed by a man who had not been the captain um, on the water, hadn't been on a boat as a captain in a couple decades. He had a political post. He ran the ship aground on a sandbar, wrecked the ship, and then the, the main leaders of the crew took off with the few lifeboats, leaving 150 passengers to die. So they had to create this raft out of bits of the ship that were left. People were injured. People uh, didn't uh, survive the entire time that they were on the raft. They even resorted in some cases to cannibalism to keep themselves going. They managed to survive for the um, 15 people of this group managed to actually survive and they were rescued. And that's what you're seeing in the painting is this towering figure at the top here waving. These figures are signaling to a ship out in the distance that's coming to, that's actually passing by and they will be able to be rescued by. So the whole composition kind of leans in this direction, mount upward, the figures go from dead and dying, mourning, some action here leading to more active figures as it builds toward the top, and it's counterbalanced by this angle of the mast going off to the other side. It's a brilliant composition of curves, movement, it does not have the stiffness of the neoclassical. It also has a higher degree, I suppose, of tragedy and less nobility in the story. But again, a remarkable example of what the romantic style really can be. One of the examples that I tend to think of as the most emblematic of the romantic style is this piece because it does have the ability to tell us something about what it is to be human, what it is to persevere, to struggle through adversity, and to come out the other side. We know that Jericho was so obsessed with making the painting accurate that he had the actual raft disassembled, brought to his studio, and rebuilt so he could paint from it. But he also did some shocking studies. These are alternate composition ideas that he tried. And then these are still lives of severed heads and body parts from a morgue. He literally tried to get the absolute real feeling of what dead and decaying flesh would be like to make the painting that much more accurate. But again, it's much more gruesome, darker in tone than what you would expect for a neoclassical artist to do. He also did portraits of people who were housed in insane asylums. That's where this piece comes from. And it has kind of the darkness of a painting, almost like the work of Velasquez. You can see that neoclassical artists and romantic artists both are still really good at painting and drawing with accurate proportion and detail. It's just that tone or the focus, the emotional impact of the work stylistically is really quite different. Uh, very uh, iconic romantic piece. This is by the painter Delacroix. Delacroix was an artist who studied at uh, an art academy, the Ecole des Beaux-Arts, studied with Jericho, so they did know each other. They also, um, to some extent, are considered the two leaders of the romantic style, kind of co-captains, if you will. The painting that you see here is not based on uh, contemporary history. It is based on ancient history, but more specifically through the lens of a contemporary piece of literature. This painting tells a story that was the basis of an epic poem by the romantic poet Lord Byron, and it tells the story of the death of Sardanapalus. When I first saw it, I assumed that Sardanapalus was the woman here with the sword at her throat, but in fact, Sardanapalus is this figure laid up here on this reclining throne or bed. That is the king. And Sardanapalus, in fact, was leader of a, a kingdom that was under attack. He is the king of Assyria, and he is about to be deposed. So rather than face this in a noble way, rather than go out and face destruction head on, he is allowing uh, himself the, the dubious pleasure of seeing all of his finest possessions destroyed so the enemy cannot have them. So his harem slaves are being killed. His finest Arabian horses are being slaughtered. His uh, 
treasures are being brought to him so that they can be burned. This is a megalomaniac, power-mad king who is in defeat rather than being noble, is showing us sort of human in extreme. He's showing us the negative aspects of hoarding, the negative aspects of wanting everything for yourself, of having the attitude of taking your toys away so that the rival cannot have them. If you think of it in terms of his ego, you begin to really feel the tragedy is more so his moral failing than almost any other aspect of his life. Of course, it's tragic for the people and animals who are being slaughtered, but it's almost all through the lens of this um, negative view of a megalomaniac leader. The painting is delicious in terms of the numbers of curves and that strong use of earth tones, reds and golds. It's very unlike the neoclassical style. Even the female bodies are a little bit more lush, a little fuller. You can see as the piece developed though, that the artist begins with different poses, with studies of anatomy that are done in a more gestural way. But even these drawings have a fair amount of detail in them. Take a look at this drawing on the left. This is one of the first quick sketches, a true loose gesture. The blue arrows show you the same figure in the original sketch and in the final paint. You can see that that reclining female figure is there in both pieces. So you get the feeling that the original compositional idea was about the overall curvaceous movement, the flow, of, if you will, of those lines and shapes. This is another uh, painting by Delacroix. This is Liberty Leading the People. This is now bringing us into the early half of the 1800s. So the neoclassical style really was quite popular among the first revolution through the reign of Napoleon. We're now seeing the romantic style kind of supplant it. This brings us to the July Revolution of 1830, which overthrows King Charles X and establishes the reign of the so-called citizen king, Louis Philippe. So we're getting closer to the actual establishment of a democracy. The painting itself is really pretty remarkable though, because what you're seeing here is a figure who is truly allegorical. Um, she is a representation of Vance, the bare-breasted, barefoot woman with the French flag carrying a rifle there with a bayonet is not really physically meant to be there. She's an embodiment of the spirit of the people. She's really, truly only visible to the figure in blue who's dying. And as he looks up, sees her, the figure of liberty, as the goal, what was the um, sacrifice of his life for, it was for this idea to save the people. You can see that people of the upper middle and lower classes are fighting side by side, that older people and young people are taking up the charge. Delacroix, in fact, was the brother of one of the generals, and he said about his work that since he couldn't fight he could at least paint on behalf of his country. So you get a feeling that this style of painting is also about trying to appeal to your emotions, to show you what the right thing is to do, but also to show you that noble sacrifice is still possible. Another remarkable painting that gives us the story of the struggle of the Greek people against the oppression of the Turks. The Turks again had invaded and controlled Greece from the late 1400s. By the 1820s, there's uprisings among the Greek people. They do eventually win back their independence by the year 1829. In fact, Lord Byron, the poet of the uh, poem about the Assyrian king Sardanapalus, actually dies working to um, help preserve Greek independence. He actually goes to fight in this battle. So you can see the world is changing dramatically. The American Revolution, French Revolution, we now have Greek independence happening. We're seeing an end of the old world and a beginning of a new world. And that story that's being told is a story that does have sacrifice behind it. And you can see that quite clearly in contrast between the older figure who survives, the younger figure who's dying. You get these feelings of references even in the poses to some of the stories 
stories that we've seen before, some of the movement and color that we saw even in the art of Rembrandt in the Baroque. So if the neoclassical is trying to kind of revive the Renaissance, then you could almost think of the Romantic style is reviving the Baroque to an extent. Turning to Spain, this is the work of the painter Goya, and Goya painted really dramatic paintings about conflict as the uh, forces of France under Napoleon are trying to take control of all of Europe. There was brutality between the French and the Spanish as the French invade and take control of Spain. So here you see the 2nd of May. This one is not very often shown, but it is an uprising of Spanish citizens against French soldiers. And of course, this uprising had to be put down. So the second painting is actually the one that you want to know for the test. The title of this one is the 3rd of May. So the first painting was the uprising on the 2nd of May. Here we have the 3rd of May, and obviously the leaders of that uprising are being put to death. Now, Goya didn't directly witness this event. He's creating it for us. You notice that the French soldiers have their faces turned away. We can't really identify them, but we can see the faces of many of the Spanish citizens who are being put to death. That main figure in the center is the only pure in the painting being lit by this lantern. His pose is kind of reminiscent even of the crucifixion pose of Christ. So we're being a bit manipulated here too, but this time by a romantic artist who wants us to feel on behalf of the Spanish how Goya felt as someone who lived in Spain during the French occupation. Now, Goya's life was even sadder um, than that because, of course, not only did he live through the occupation, but he also became deaf. And so he witnessed the suffering of his country, and then he also lost this major ability to communicate easily with his uh, people. So he increasingly turns to his art, and his art becomes a little bit darker, sometimes even a bit gory. These are images that he created as prints, which were to show the inhumanity, the brutality of the French soldiers against the Spanish people. So they would, in order to try to put down revolution, they would display the mutilated bodies of people they had tortured. And that was to kind of vent people um, or discourage people from rising up against them. You can imagine that these images known collectively as the disasters of war would have been extremely uh, difficult to make, difficult for people to look at. But Goya again reminds us of the necessity of looking at these types of images because they help remind us to avoid this type of inhuman treatment, to um, kind of stand against tyranny is sort of the theme behind the works. His later work is very dark, and this, believe it or not, is a painting that was originally in his home. He lived with it, and it was in his dining room. The painting takes a mythological subject, Saturn devouring his children. Saturn was one of the gods before the Olympic gods. Uh, he did swallow his children as they were born. Um, he is the father of Zeus. By the time Zeus is born, his mother refuses to give him over to uh, Saturn or Kronos to be devoured. She actually tricks him and hides the child. Zeus grows up to adulthood, comes back, kills his father, and because his uh, offspring, his uh, siblings rather, are immortal gods, they all emerge from the corpse of the father uh, unharmed. But that's not the part that Goya is showing us. He's showing us the idea of the creator, the father, destroying the creation. You can imagine that a man who went through this saw the ravages of being occupied by a foreign power, the brutality of war, losing his sense of hearing. You can sense that in the painting he is crying out to us about how difficult life can be, how it feels sometimes as though the very force that created you is out to destroy you. It's interesting to me that this painting, which is perhaps the most important of the romantic paintings of Goya, is so similar in its theme to the novel Frankenstein. And 
we often think of Frankenstein in terms of the films in which the monster more often than not is portrayed as really stupid and bumbling. But in the original novel, which if you haven't read it, I highly recommend, Mary Shelley gives the monster a voice that is really quite eloquent. And the monster actually confronts the scientist who creates him and calls him the creator. In fact, he calls him a heartless creator. And he actually asks at some point why it is, you know, that if this creator put him here, if this person that he should be able to depend upon had created him, then why is that the very person who rejected him? It's a kind of fascinating story, and it really fits into the tone of what romanticism is all about. So romantic has drama, curve, color. Um, usually it's dark in tone, often dark in terms of shadow. But I want you to think about the fact that these stories of people pushed to the extreme are things that are very similar to the culture we live in now. If you're a fan of stories um, on television, the situation that the characters in The Walking Dead are in is kind of similar to a theme that the romantics would have found interesting. The themes of the monster, the person who's the other, the outsider in society, also very prominent themes in romanticism.